Well, hey, church family, we're excited to worship with you. We're going to get started in just about five minutes. Um, so make sure to gather the family around. If you can, uh, if you can screencast or screen mirror uh, this service up onto a large screen in your home, that would be ideal. Um, we're going to have a time of communion. So we would love for you to gather some items together to be ready to, to take communion. Um, and then we'll, we'll be together just shortly. So um, we're looking forward to having you join us today for worship.
All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Pikes Peak Christian Church Online Sunday service. We're so glad that you joined us today. And we're here to lead you in worship and get into the Word. And so let me uh, just kind of tell you what to expect real fast before we dive in. We are going to do this like a regular service. Uh, we're going to do our, our couple songs of worship together. But just so you know, after worship, we're going to have communion together. So uh, I just want to tell you beforehand so you can be prepared. If you need to go grab some bread or juice or something, even if it's orange juice, you know, it's okay. And if you don't have anything, that's totally fine. But uh, we want to invite you to participate with us. And I'll lead you through that once we're done with uh, our opening worship here. So um, we're super pumped that you're here. Thank you for tuning in. And please, please, please share this with all of your friends. Hit like, hit all the hearts and, and everything, comment. We'd love to connect with you because we can't be together in the same room. So please do that. You did a great job last week. We reached a lot of people. So um, let's do it again today. Let's pray and we'll worship together. Father, we thank you that um, you are here with us in all of these different ways. We thank you that only you could do that. You could be present across the world with all of the believers. And uh, we call on the name of Jesus now to come and meet us where we are as we send up praises to you. God, I thank you that blessings are coming down and that you are the king. So we worship you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. In Jesus' name, amen.
Stop working, you never stop, yeah. you never stop. Come on, sing it with us. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Thank you, God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And our aim this morning is to lift you up as high as we possibly can because you are worthy of it. So we give you glory with all our hearts, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. Father, we thank you that your word is like food to us always, but especially in these times. We fight with it. <clears throat> we do battle with it. <clears throat> we stand on it, God. God, we thank you. Your word says no weapon formed against us shall prosper. though we have trouble that we should take heart for you have overcome the world so I want to say thank you for that God and I pray that your Holy Spirit continue to just pour out on people joining with us right now that they would begin to experience the power of your Holy Spirit the victory that comes with surrendering to you the fear that is disappearing right now in Jesus name faith that is rising want all of those things and more, God. Come, Lord Jesus.
battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. charge in these times. We thank you that you promise good things are coming even though it may be hard right now. You've come to give us an abundant life and we're standing on that right now. God, we intercede for so many people who are hurting and afraid and God, we call on your name to be there with them to come and do a miracle. God, for those who need a job, who need some finances for provision, we thank you that you are the provider and nothing is too hard for you. So we intercede for the world who needs Jesus right now. And uh, we thank you that victory is coming. In Jesus' name, everybody can agree and say amen. 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 Well, like I said, we're going to move into a time of communion now. And so if you want to go ahead and grab those elements, if you have them, that's great. Um, you can take just a minute to go grab those. And if you don't have them, again, it's totally fine. Um, just spend some time quiet, quietly now praying. Uh, to Jesus and spending time with him. Okay, this is a great time to not be looking at the news, to not be looking at all of the negative stuff that's out there because there's plenty of that. This is our time to look to Jesus as our healer, as our victory, as our savior. And so for those of you especially who are watching who aren't going to church, who aren't familiar with what communion is, this is our time that Jesus taught us to do in remembrance of him. We take a piece of bread which represents his body that was put on a cross with nails. He willingly went to the cross to give his life for us. And that bread that we eat represents his body. And he also said, take a cup of juice, which represents his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. A new covenant between God and man where before it was looking bad, our sin separated us from God. But Jesus came that we might have life and be forgiven of our sins so that we're no longer separated from our Heavenly Father, but we can be one again. And Jesus prays that we might be one, and this is a great opportunity for you to be open to what he did for you on the cross. It's free. It's nothing. You don't owe anything. All you have to do is say, thank you, God, that you gave your son Jesus to die for my sins. And I guarantee you, you will experience forgiveness like you've never experienced before. And so for those of you who are ready... I would like you to go ahead and take the cup of juice and the piece of bread, eat and drink those after I pray, all right? God, we give you glory that these things are true, no matter the status of the world, no matter how we're meeting, um, whether it's in person or on a screen. We thank you, God, that the truth of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ will never change, and it is the foundation that we build our lives upon. And so we give you praise for it, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch people all over the world with the forgiveness that Jesus made possible through the cross and through the empty grave. And uh, we just want to say thank you. We give you glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody all over say amen. 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 While you're taking communion, we're just going to play a little bit of instrumental music, and you can spend some time, about a minute, in prayer. And then we'll hand it over to Pastor Darren.
Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. This is church in a different way than we've ever experienced before, but thank you so much for taking time to be with us. For our Pikes Peak Christian Church family, uh, this is our new normal. And for those of you who are visiting, we're so glad that you dropped in with us today. Uh, we do something every Sunday at church where we take up an offering to support the ministries of the church. And I want our church family to know that ministry has not stopped. We have continued to do a lot of ministry, a lot of different kinds of ministry over these weeks, and we'll continue to do that. So we appreciate those who've already continued to give, and if you're able to continue to support the church and our ministries, you can do that by going online uh, at yestogod.org slash give, and we will provide a link for you to follow as well. But uh, we appreciate you giving during this um, strange season so that we can continue to do our ministry. So I wanna say a blessing over those gifts as you give today. Father, thank you for the privilege to support your work. We thank you that the church is at the front lines of what you're doing in the world, not only our church, but so many churches. Bless them, Father, sustain them. Uh, we trust that you will provide for the needs of the, of the churches, our missionaries that we support, and all the ministries that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we are starting a brand new series for the next several weeks. We're going to be going through the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 17 to the very end, and really looking at Jesus and how he leads his disciples through um, just a season of crisis. And I think it's good for all of us to grab a hold of Jesus' hand and follow him through the season because we're getting bombarded with news reports, uh, the broadcasts over the airwaves, um, the messages from our friends of, of the numbers continuing to rise of those that are infected with the virus, the economic turmoil, uh, the shutdowns. I mean, all these things going on. And it can be kind of depressing. It can be sad and, and disturbing. We need a message of hope. And I believe that if we would just kind of fix our eyes on Jesus, uh, he's going to get us through this. And I actually believe he's going to make us stronger because of this. I think he's going to do some really good things in the midst of this season. And so if you have a Bible, you may get it ready. Um, we're going to be in John chapter 17 today. And the title of my message is Jesus is praying for you. You can tell a lot about a person by where they turn during a crisis. Uh, many people turn away. I mean, if a crisis comes, they, they disconnect. They, they uh, just pour themselves into a, a, a work habit, a hobby, shopping, eating, uh, maybe a destructive habit like drugs or alcohol. They just want to get away from the crisis so I don't have to think about it. That, that's a good number of people do that. There, there are others, though, who are very courageous who kind of just barge in when there's a crisis, something rises within them, a competitive urge that they're gonna get in there and they're gonna tackle this issue. And I heard a phrase a long time ago that says, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And sometimes it can be a very foolish thing just to simply charge ahead because I believe we ought to take a, a message from Jesus and what he did during the biggest crisis of his life. See, he was getting ready to go to the cross. He was gonna die for our sins and, and this is going to be a really excruciating physically, mental time in his life. And if we would look at what Jesus did, he didn't turn away. He didn't hide. He didn't disconnect, nor did he rush right in. He actually pushed a pause button in prayer. And we're going to learn about Jesus' prayer and what he prayed about tonight. See, uh, to give you some context, this all took place um, in the upper room. Jesus had gathered his disciples together for a meal. We know that as the Last Supper... And it was on Thursday night, it was the week of Passover. If you don't know much about Passover, Passover was an annual celebration for the Jewish people. And during that night, Jesus um, washed his disciples' feet. He gave them a new commandment that they would love each other as he loved them. He told them about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit would come into their lives and guide them through this period. He told them about the persecution to come, the trouble they would have in the world. And so. All this was taking place that night, the night of the Last Supper. And during their meal, he, he broke the bread and he passed it to his disciples. They took the cup of, of wine and they, they drank it. And it um, brought back memories of a period of time when their ancestors, the Jewish people, were in exile. They were in Egypt as slaves. And they cried out to God time and time again to rescue them. And so God raised up a man named Moses. Moses came, he was their deliverer. He brought them out of Egypt. He established them uh, as a people out in the wilderness. And during that time, God instituted this thing called the, the Passover. See, the night before they left Egypt, they sacrificed a lamb, took the blood of the lamb, put it over the doorposts of their homes, ate a meal in haste. And uh, and the angel that night, the death angel, when he came, passed over, that's where you get the name Passover, passed over the homes of those that had been covered by the blood of the lamb. 
So on this night, as they're celebrating this ancient deliverance, Jesus is foreshadowing what is about to happen. See, he is, he is going to lead a new group of people out of bondage to sin. He himself is going to become the Lamb of God. When Jesus came on the scene, as his cousin John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus will be the sacrificial Lamb, the fulfillment of the Passover. And not only that, he'll be the priest that offers the Lamb. Isn't that ironic? He's the Lamb, and he's the priest, the great high priest, the ultimate priest, who offers his own life as a sacrifice for sin. And so Jesus is embodying the Passover. And after they have the meal, he then goes out into the night to a place called the Garden of the Gethsemane to pray. Now we can read about that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, how, how Jesus gathered, he brought his disciples in, and, and Jesus encouraged his disciples to pray, and yet what'd they do? They kept falling asleep. And, and so Jesus is there crying out to God. He's crying out to God to hear his prayer. And uh, it's a very sincere prayer because you might remember that, that Jesus was in agony before the Father. It said that he had um, sweat like drops of blood. It was so intense. And he said, Father, if it, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. And yet Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. He wasn't going to be able to avoid the cross, but you know, he was human. He was in a physical body. He experienced pain, emotional stress, just like you and I have experienced and maybe in some ways are experiencing right now. And yet Jesus knew that he should pray. And so I want to re begin reading um, in John chapter 17, starting with verse 1. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And then he said, he's getting ready to pray. And before we actually look at his prayer, I, I want to just say a, a couple things about Jesus and his habit of prayer. See, why, why did Jesus pray? Why did Jesus have to pray? He's the son of God. He's like Superman in Clark's Kent. Clark Kent's clothing. I mean, why would Jesus have to pray? And yet we find that was his pattern all through his ministry. He'd often go off into the hills early in the morning and he would pray. And Jesus tells us later that he didn't do anything except what the Father told him. And so I believe that Jesus went off to get directions from his Father, to get affirmation from his Father, and to process his thoughts, being in a human body, processing his thoughts with the Father, Jesus needed to pray. And it just makes me think, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do you and I need to pray? I mean, isn't this a stressful time right now? Isn't this coronavirus thing shaking you up a bit? And if Jesus was facing a crisis and he prayed, doesn't it tell us that one of the best things we could do is just kind of push the pause button, pray, you get with your spouse and pray, gather your kids together and pray? Get on FaceTime with relatives or friends and pray. I mean, if, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more would we need to pray right now? We also find um, that Jesus' prayer style, his, his method of praying was a little bit different. It says he lifted his eyes to heaven. See, I grew up in a culture where we, we always bow our heads in prayer. In fact, we always tell our kids, bow your heads in prayer. But Jesus lifted his eyes this time to pray. Um, you can pray in a lot of different ways. Uh, people in the Bible kneel to pray. There's a, a story about a man who's a tax collector. He comes before God and he's so ashamed of his sin that, that he bows his head in prayer. Can't even lift his face up. We find David when he's praying for his son who's dying. He lays prostrate on the ground to pray. And, but here Jesus lifts his eyes up because his body is praying with his heart. And I think that's the key, that your body expresses what you're trying to communicate. And if your prayer is like, God, I need help from you, then it makes sense to look up because where is God? He's our Father who art where? In heaven. So he's looking up and he's praying to his Father in heaven. I sometimes think if my prayers could not be verbalized, how would my body pray? How would I like gesture prayer? Maybe think of that sometimes when you pray because sometimes it's good to get your hands up. Uh, the Bible says to lift up holy hands in prayer. So it says sometimes lift up your voice in prayer. In fact, we find that many of the prayers in Scripture were very audible prayers. People cried out. They called out. They say that God heard their voices. And so Jesus is lifting up his voice in prayer. Now, what did he pray? Uh, we don't know exactly the full content of his prayer. I have a feeling that as we read through John 17 that it may take us two minutes to read that entire prayer. I have a feeling Jesus prayed more than two minutes. 
And it's true with a lot of scripture. John, who wrote this down, overheard Jesus because it was one of the habits of Jesus to pray out loud. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. So we know that Jesus often raised his voice in prayer, and so the disciples are hearing him pray. And John hears his prayer, and, and what we have written down is probably John's recollection of what he remembered from that prayer, that the key parts of that prayer. And really, that's what we need to know. That's why God put in this scripture the, the things that are there so that we would know what Jesus is praying for. Now, we're going to look at the beginning of the prayer, uh, starting with verses 1 through 5. And Jesus says this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Uh, before Jesus actually prays for his disciples and those that would come to follow him, he prays about himself. I mean, just a, just a few words here. He's praying about himself. And he, he prays that he would glorify God. I mean, that was his whole purpose of life. You know, there's a number of times he uses the word glorify or glorified. He says, God, I want to glorify you with my life. May my life not be about me, but about you. Because he knew that he was on earth to bring people's attention back to the Father. It wasn't to even focus so much on him, but to draw people to the Father. And so how is he going to do that? How is Jesus going to glorify him? He says, I'm going to do it by accomplishing the work you sent me to do. So in just a few hours, Jesus is going to be not only arrested, he's going to be tried, he'll be tortured and hung on a cross. And in that whole process of dying for sin, he is going to bring glory to God. You might wonder, well, how? How will this gruesome thing bring glory to God? Well, simply by the fact that it's going to bring people into a relationship with God. And when they're in a relationship with God, they have the opportunity to be with God forever. Um, as, I, as I read through this passage, um, I'm struck by this phrase about, about honoring God and, and glorifying God with his life because that was Jesus' whole focus of his life. And so he, he does that just to set the stage. You know, this is what I'm about. And now he shifts his attention to pray for people and to pray ultimately for us. Uh, do you have someone praying for you? There's a gentleman in our church. He's passed away now, but he was in charge of our prison ministry. And some of you know a guy named Kelly Barlow. And Kelly became a Christian late in life. I think he was in his 40s when he gave his life to Christ, was baptized. But when Kelly um, grew up and kind of got into a wild lifestyle, all during that time, he said his mother was praying for him. It took a while for those prayers to get answered, but they were answered. And Kelly found the Lord. Not only found the Lord, he became a, a servant for the Lord. I remember reading the story about a man named Charles Finney. Charles Finney was a, a lawyer who was converted and became a, one of the greatest evangelists of our history. But 100 years ago, he began traveling all through the Northeast, preaching God's word. And uh, it's, it's believed that a half million people came to know the Lord through his work. But what many people don't know is that Charles Finney had a man behind the scenes. His name was Daniel Nash. Daniel was a fired pastor who had some eye difficulties. And this man decided that he was going to devote his life to praying. And he would go into cities ahead of Charles Finney and just pray. He'd pray that God would anoint the preaching. He prayed that people's hearts would be softened to the word. And, uh, and when he did that, it's like the floodgates of heaven broke open and hundreds and thousands of people came to know the Lord. And after Nash died, Charles Finney actually stopped doing revivals. And he went back to local church ministry because he knew how important it was that he had someone praying behind the scenes. Do you have someone praying for you? I know there's someone praying for you. His name is Jesus. And he's praying for you and he's praying for me. And that's where we turn our attention now. I'm going to start reading, uh, starting with verses uh, 6 through 11. And as I read through this, He's talking specifically about his disciples, but, but 
he's really speaking of anybody who would follow because these same principles apply not only to those disciples back then, but to, but to us as well. So he says, I've manifested your name to your people whom you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you, have, and you gave them to me, that they have, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those that you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. See, Jesus' goal is that, that we would be connected. In fact, that's the first prayer request that Jesus has. He, he prays that we would be connected. He says, uh, this is eternal life, that they may know you. He prays that we would be connected, first of all, to God, that, that we would have a, a connection to him. I grew up in a church where I believed in God, heard about God my whole life. I never knew that God wanted to have a relationship with me. I, I thought that if I just believed, I'd die, I would die one day and I'd go to heaven. But Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That eternal life could be defined as being in a relationship with God. That's kind of new for me because I thought eternal life meant going to heaven and living forever. Now, you do get to do that when you have a relationship with God, but it's, it's more than that. A relationship with God is what eternal life is. You may never have thought of this, but everyone will live forever somewhere. The Bible says that everyone will rise from the dead. Everyone will stand before the Lord. And you will either live forever with him or apart from him. And Jesus gives us the opportunity to be connected to the Father by putting our faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. And when we do that, uh, an amazing thing happens. We then get to live our lives, just like Jesus, for God's glory. And Jesus said, I'm glorified in them. Those are the people that I'm glorified in. How? Because as we live out our lives as Christians, we bring glory to God. And there's coming a day, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, when we will join with the angels, with people from all past generations, all tribes, tongues, nations, all gathered together. And it says in Revelation 5, we will, we will say this, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor, glory and power forever and ever. God wants us connected to the Father and to the Son, and that's what eternal life is. And Jesus said that God has chosen us for that. But at the same time, he says, those that are chosen have heard the word, they've received it, they believe on it, and they keep his word. And in a sense, those people have also chosen God. Now, which is it? Does God choose us or do we choose God? And my answer is yes, it's both. It's kind of like a couple that gets married. Uh, this week, a young couple from our church, Stephen and Leandria, are getting married. In fact, by now they're already married. And I was to go to Georgia this week to perform their ceremony, but things didn't work out because of the virus, but they're moving forward with their wedding. And over these last several months, as they've grown in their love for each other, it's very clear that Stephen has chosen Leandria and Leandria has chosen Stephen. And because they've chosen each other, they're bound in this kind of inseparable relationship. God has chosen you to be in relationship with him, but he invites you in turn to choose him so you can seal that relationship. See, God actually chooses everyone. Now, I know not everyone believes that, but I do. I believe that God wants everyone to be in relationship with him. And the fact that Jesus actually says that, that Judas was among those that God gave him, but Judas went off another direction, tells me that Jesus chose Judas, but Judas didn't choose Jesus. But you have an opportunity to choose Jesus. And we as a church want to help you. If you don't know him, if you don't know what it means to have a relationship with him, a little later in the service, we'll tell you how you can respond to this message today and that we'll help you uh, establish that relationship. So there's a connection with God the Father and his Son, and there's a connection with other believers. It's a really big deal that we are unified. In fact, that's the heart of Jesus' prayer, that they may be one. O-N-E, one, meaning we're unified, we're together. 
The opposite of unity is division, division, uh, multiple visions. It, when you have multiple visions, you go this way, that way. And it doesn't work in a marriage. It doesn't work in a business. It doesn't work in a church. People go opposite directions. God wants us to be unified. And Satan has a major agenda of driving wedges in relationships. And maybe even this season of turmoil in our culture is a time where he's trying to drive a wedge between you and, and your boss, you and your family, you and your church, because he wants to divide us, but Jesus wants to unite us. He wants to knit us together. Because when we're united with the Father, we're also brought into a relationship with the, with the spiritual family called the church, and we're together. And, and unfortunately, not, churches aren't great at being unified. I just have to be honest. We struggle with that at times. And you can go through church history, and, it, and it's because of maybe our beliefs, maybe because of, of leaders in the church or personality of the pastor, but we kind of go our own different ways. And there's over 1,200 different flavors or denominations of churches. I mean, just the Baptist church alone has over 70 varieties. There's Southern Baptist, Free Will Baptist, Seventh-day Baptist, Two Seed in the Spirit, Predestinarian Baptist. I mean, all kinds of Baptists, General Baptists, Regular Baptists. I'm sure there's an Irregular Baptist. I don't know, there's all kinds. But when we're unified, the Holy Spirit knits us together, and we can accomplish far more when we're in harmony than we ever could apart. When we drop those labels, we just focus on Jesus, God can do so much through us. It's a powerful witness to the world when the church is unified. And to be honest, it's a little foretaste of heaven. Now, I want to do a little experiment. I've done this before in church, but I want you to participate. On the count of three, I want you to shout out the denomination or flavor of church that you grew up in. And, and maybe if you didn't participate, it's your parents. So some of you have a Catholic background. My, my family was Methodist. Some of you are Lutheran, you know, whatever it is. Uh, on the count of three, I want you to shout out what is your background, okay? One, two, three, Methodist. I heard a whole variety there. Whole, whole lot of different names, a lot of different words. And now I wanna try something different. I want each of you to shout out on the count of three the name of your savior, the name of the one you are trusting your life to, the name of the person that you're putting your hope in, okay? You know who that, that is? You, you do, you know who it is. The count of three, I want you to shout his name out, okay? One, two, three, Jesus! I heard the same name all over the place because Jesus is the name that unifies us. And you know, during tough times like this, this is when we need each other the most. I mean, we're in the midst of a crisis, unprecedented crisis as a nation, but this is the time when churches pull together. This is a time when actually we need each other more than ever. And I've always believed that when you're busy rowing the boat, you don't have time to complain about the food service. And when you're busy just diving in, helping people, um, letting God use you to serve other people, I mean, there's very little to complain about because we're so grateful for what God has done. He's praying for us to be connected. Secondly, uh, let, let's read through the, the last part of this prayer because there's two other uh, prayer requests that Jesus um, gives, but they're both captured in this last section. Jesus says, starting with verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus not only prays for us to be connected, he prays for us here that we would be protected. protected. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. We live in a dangerous world. It's, it's a tough place for people of faith. And the reason it's so tough is because of the ruler of this place. It's a, it's a character Jesus calls the evil one. Now we know his name, his name's Satan, but he goes by a lot of other names in the Bible. He's the deceiver, he's the tempter, he's the roaring lion, he's the murderer, he's the, he's the enemy of our souls. And he's the ruler of this world right now. How did he become ruler of this world? I mean, we don't see him. And we didn't necessarily choose him to be ruler, but, but wait a minute. Just like 
our country has an election every year, we've actually elected Satan to be the ruler. The, the Bible actually says that we have abdicated the authority that God has given us to, to manage this world, and we have chosen him, Satan, to be the ruler of our lives. And we follow his leading, we follow his path, and it's led us down some very dangerous um, roads. But God says, beware. In fact, he says, beware of the evil one in this world and that he rules. Now, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And Jesus describes the world in, in different ways. Sometimes he says the, the world is just the, the physical thing. You know, the, God made the world. That's the physical thing. But, but the world can also be the people in the world. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He loves all the people of the world. But there's another use of the world, and that is this worldly system that's ruled by the evil one. And he tells us to be careful of that world, that this world and its desires will pass away. And so we know that this world is, is a very dangerous place, especially for people of faith. And we have the opportunity to choose not to be of the world, but to be of Christ. Uh, you sports fans heard the big news this week that Tom Brady is no longer a New England Patriot. Can I hear hallelujah? Um, Patriots are not favored to win the Super Bowl, and he's gone to Tampa Bay. It's kind of a shocking piece of news that this man who'd been with one team for, I don't know, 20 some years is changing sides. He's now with a, a whole different team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Well, you know, uh, we, by our choice early in life, by choosing sin, have become part of Satan's team. And at some point, we have to say, I don't want to be part of that team anymore. I'm switching sides. When you make Jesus Lord and Savior, you give your life to him, you surrender to him, you switch sides. The Bible actually says you've, you've been transferred from one kingdom to another, one team to another. That's what we desire. And, and therefore, we aren't of the world anymore, even though we're in the world. And we have to be aware that there are two primary battlefields in the world. Number one, it's external. That's the physical threats. And so right now we're dealing with uh, disease. That's a physical threat. And Satan can leverage that against us. I mean, it's causing a lot of fear. It's causing a lot of hardship. Economic um, downfall, that's an external factor. Uh, food shortage or famine can be an external factor. Persecution, affliction, all those things can come. You can read about a character in the Old Testament named Job who, who experienced a lot of those things. And they're, they're all external attacks. That's one of the, the battlefields. But you know there's a bigger battlefield? It's internal. It's right here and it's right here. The battlefield of the mind and the battlefield of the heart. Those are the places where Satan can get a foothold. He can really take us down. And when I, when I talk about the, the mind, what I'm thinking of is the things we think about, the things that we just are obsessed with daily, that cause us worry, that cause us fear, that cause us anxiety. I mean, those are all swirling in our head constantly. It can just it can play wreak havoc on us. And then there's the feelings of our heart, that emotional feelings, depression, uh, um, stomachs turning, I mean, clenching, the internal things in our heart. Uh, Satan uses both of those to get a grip on us uh, and to cause us to not trust God and not believe that God is doing something good in our midst. And I just want to encourage you that the safest place you can be is in the Lord's care. In fact, I would encourage you, if you're dealing with fear and anxiety, to to look at Psalm 91. A lot of our soldiers pray Psalm 91, but here's how that Psalm starts. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Did you hear there? God is my refuge and my fortress. I'm protected under his shadow, which means I'm close enough to him that his shadow protects me. Is God your refuge right now from the, the attacks that are happening all around us to the disturbance in our hearts and, and in our minds? Let your mind be comforted by his truth. Let your heart be comforted by his presence. I mentioned last Sunday, Philippians 4, where we're told that not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, to present your request to God. Uh, but the most important part is what happens next. It's in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. It says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, means it's mind-blowing, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And what I love about that word guard is it's a military word. 
It, it's, it's a word that refers to a soldier who's standing at attention to protect whatever is behind him. It says the peace of God is like a soldier that protects your heart from those feelings, those uneasy feelings, protects your mind from those distracting, destructive thoughts. And how do I, how do I bring that peace into my life? He says through prayer, through prayer, presenting your request to God and he will guard your heart and mind. Well, one other request, it's the last couple of verses of his prayer, end of, chapter, uh, end of the chapter, chapter 17 of John, verses 18, 19. Jesus says, as you send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. He prays that we would be active. He prays that we would be active. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. This dangerous place. He's sending us out into it. Why? Because he's working through us. We are his hands, we're his feet. Jesus is doing his work through us in this world. He does love the world. He doesn't love the world system, but he loves the people of this world. And through us, as he sends us out all across this globe, we get to do his work in this world. I love what A.W. Tozer, a famous Christian preacher, writer said. This was many, many years ago. He said, a scared world needs a fearless church. The world's scared right now. And we as believers need to show them that God, God is a place of refuge. And we don't have to be afraid because of who God is. I mean, it sounds, you know, it might sound kind of naive, but I really believe it's true. And I've seen it around me that people who are trusting God are finding strength in this time. A scared world needs a fearless church. See, Jesus entered this world knowing it was difficult. I mean, he got resistance. People rejected him. People opposed him. Um, people tried to kill him. And there were others who loved him and believed in him. And the same will happen with you and me. It'll be, it may be tough. We may be persecuted. We may be mocked. And yet there'll be those individuals who, because of what we do for Christ, who enter into relationship with Jesus and find the peace of God in their own life. This week, I, I shared a post on Facebook that many of you have reposted, but it was this. The love of Jesus can spread faster than any virus, be infectious with love. See, while that, while that virus is just spreading, we're actually trying to contain it and reduce it, I pray that the love of Christ actually becomes more infectious, that we see more people going out of their way to love their neighbors, love strangers, be generous to people. And we have an opportunity as believers to go out, to be sent into this world, to make a difference, to be agents of love uh, who Jesus works through. And what does that look like? It means... Uh, Sharing your food and your toilet paper with someone else. It means having, having a moment of prayer over FaceTime or a phone call with someone. It means checking up on people that you know are, are lonely at this time. It means being gracious around people who are in panic. It's just being a, a loving person, being encouraging, being hopeful, being inspiring to them, putting posts on Facebook that are encouraging to others. You know, I've, I've had a great week working with our staff. I and mean, we've got a great staff. And every morning we've gathered together just to just to plan out the day. What are we doing today? What do we need to do? How can we do ministry better? And it's actually been exciting. It's sort of like the two-minute drill in football. You know, team has two minutes left, and they have to improvise, and their goal is to get down as quick as they can. And so they start doing different things, and that's what we're doing as a church. And honestly, it's kind of fun because we're, we're in the two-minute drill period, and God is doing some amazing things as we're being creative in ministry. Devote yourself to God's work. Jesus said, I have sanctified them meaning I've set them apart. That's what that word means, consecrate. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means Jesus has set us apart for a purpose. He set you apart for a purpose. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a missionary. You don't have to be a Bible teacher. But he set you apart with a purpose. And I just want to challenge you to ask yourself, what is your purpose? What's my purpose here on earth? What does God want to do right now in this period of time through me? In other words, what am I doing on earth for heaven's sake? Jesus is praying for us. He's praying that we be connected to the Father and to the Son. And if you don't know Jesus, we want to help you enter into that relationship. In just a few moments, Pastor Dustin is going to share with you how you can respond and let us know your needs. Secondly, Jesus is praying that we be protected from the world and the evil one. 
And maybe you're feeling the, the heat right now. Maybe you're, you're going through some real stressful times. Maybe it feels like it's beyond what you're able to fight against. And we want to come along beside you. We want to pray for you. And so on that response form, you can let us know how we can do that. And we also want to be active in God's mission. We want to do our part to help Jesus be known in this world. And so uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I ask you to reach out to, to Jesus because he's praying for you. He is. And the Bible says that he always lives to intercede for us. So he's in heaven at the right hand of God, but he's praying for you, he's praying for me, that we would do those very things. I, I never thought of this until, until recently that we get to answer Jesus' prayer by how we respond to this message today. We get to answer Jesus' prayer by being connected, by allowing him to protect us, and being active in what he's doing in this world. So I'm going to close here in prayer. And uh, if we can serve you in any way, please let us know. We're going to continue to worship together like this for the next several weeks. We don't know what the future looks like uh, as far as meeting together. Uh, so stay in God's word uh, all during this time. Check us out on Facebook as we continually post messages about what's happening in the church and maybe some words of encouragement and latest updates. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the uh, privilege of being prayed for by Jesus. We know that he prays for us constantly. And Lord, I pray that those prayers would comfort us and cause us to want to surrender our lives even more to you. I know in your word it says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And if there ever was a righteous man, it's Jesus. I know his prayers are powerful and may they be effective in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, church family. My name is Pastor Dustin. Um, I'm our student pastor here at Pikes Peak Christian Church. And I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for, for hanging out with your family and gathering people together and worshiping alongside us today. Uh, we want to know what's going on in your family. We want to know how we can pray with you. Pastor Darren mentioned that in his sermon today. So you can go to www.yestogod.org slash connect form uh, to let us know how we can pray for you and how we can meet some, some physical and emotional um, and, and spiritual needs of yours. And we even want to follow up with you and, and call you and pray with you. Um, so please take some time to to go to that form, fill that out um, so we can connect with you. I also want you to know that our student ministry and our children's ministry still have ministry going on. Um, so we want you to, uh, to see what's happening there. Pastor Jace has been doing a great job and we got some good stuff going on for our student ministry. So check our website, check Facebook. A very practical uh, way to connect with student ministry specifically is to text at MS Incline to the phone number 81010 to get our messages for middle school and then text at HS altitude to 81010 to get our messages for high school. And then I know there's other ways to connect with children's ministry. So again, check our website, check Facebook, stay connected. We love you church family. Uh, we'll see you next week.